Right, let us help you with your physics by going over a paper to, it's the Edexcel paper, they call it combined paper 6, well that does mean it's physics paper 2, and it's higher tier, you get 1 hour and 10 minutes, so that's 70 minutes to answer 60 marks worth of questions. Alright, let's go. Question 1 here. Figure 1 shows the results from an experiment where the potential difference, that just means voltage, across a filament lamp was varied. The current and voltage were measured. Describe the relationship between the current and the voltage as shown in the graph in Figure 1. Right, well as the voltage is getting bigger, you can see the current is getting bigger. And because it's a curve, we say it's non-linear. So if it was a straight line, then we'd say that was linear. And actually, if it goes through 0, 0, we can also say it's directly proportional. If you had a line that was like that, so it was a straight line, but it didn't go through the origin, 0, 0, so that's linear, and this one here is directly proportional. Which basically means if you were to double this x value, the y value would double. Part 2. Use the values of the voltage and current at point P and at point Q on the graph in figure 1 to complete the table in figure 2. Right, so we just need to see what the voltage and current is at P and Q. So if we just scroll back up. P, the voltage is 1 and the current is 20 milliamps. And at point Q, the voltage is what? About 3.4? And the current looks like it's about 43 or 44 milliamps. Part 3. Calculate the resistance of the filament lamp when the voltage is 4.5 volts and the current is 50 milliamps. Use the equation. Right, just need to pop the numbers in. So 4.5 volts, that's your voltage, divided by, now 51 milliamps, remember that's 51 times 10 to the minus 3 amps, because a milliamp is a thousandth of an amp. So you go 51 divided by a thousand, or that's the same as 51 times 10 to the minus 3. And the answer is 88.235. Now I get asked by me students how many decimal places should I use. Right, use the same number of decimal places as they did. So one decimal place. If they give you a couple of numbers and the other number has got two decimal places, then you do it to two decimal places. Always use the highest number of decimal places that they have. Part 4. Explain why the resistance of the filament lamp changes as the voltage across it increases. Right, so they're saying resistance changes. Well, we need to be more specific straight away. So we know that the resistance of a bulb or filament lamp increases as more voltage goes across it. That's because more current will go through it, and that's what makes it hot. And as the temperature increases, there'll be more collisions between the ions and the electrons. That's basically what resistance is. It's collisions between the electrons as they try to go down through the wire. Question 5. 
Question two. Describe in terms of particles two differences between a solid and a liquid of the same substance. Right, well the particles in a solid are closer together and also the particles in a solid are in nice neat rows. I mean there's more things that you can see as well. Particles in a solid have less energy compared to a liquid. Part B. Figure 3 shows the dimensions of a solid block of concrete. Density of concrete rho equals 2100 kilograms per meter cubed. Calculate the mass of the concrete block. Use the equation mass equals density times by volume. Well, that's nice. It gave us the equation, so let's pop the density in. Now, to get the volume, you're going to have to do the length times by the width times by the height. And when you multiply that together, that comes out as 630 kilograms. Question C. Figure 4 shows a shed made mostly of concrete blocks. State two practical ways to reduce heat loss from this shed. Right, well it's got a door, so let's say use a draft excluder. It's got a window, so we'll say use double glazing. It's got walls, so let's say use a insulation in the walls. You could have a cavity wall, for example, or you could make the bricks thicker. That would decrease the thermal conductivity. Part D. On a very cold day, the temperature of the air is minus 4 degrees C. Calculate the value of this temperature on the Kelvin scale. Right, so minus 273 degrees C, that equals 0 Kelvin. That's what we call absolute 0. So if we're going all the way up to zero degrees C, we've got to add 273 degrees C. So that means we'd also need to add 273 Kelvin because one degree C increase equals one Kelvin increase. Just in case your teachers didn't tell you that or you couldn't remember. Right, so we haven't got zero, we've got minus four. So we'd have to take minus four off zero to get the minus four. So that means we need to take four off the 273. So that would be 269. I mean the conversion really, if you can remember it, is to go to Kelvin, you take the temperature in degrees C's and you basically just add 273 to it. So it'll be minus 4 plus 273 and that equals your 269 Kelvin. If you want to go to degrees C's from Kelvin you'd need your temperature in Kelvin and you need to take away 273. That's why I like to do this little chart down here. It helps you to visualise what's going on. Question 3. Part A. A student uses plot and compasses to investigate the magnetic field between the poles of two bar magnets. Figure 5 shows one of the plot and compasses and one of the bar magnets. The student places the two magnets on a piece of paper with a pole of one magnet 
a few centimetres away from a pole of the other magnet. The student places 20 plotting compasses on the paper near the magnets. Figure 6 shows the direction in which each of the plot and compasses points. Part 1. Draw two rectangles on figure 6 to show the positions of the two bar magnets. Now what we know is that a magnetic field comes out of the north and goes into the south. And if we've got two plot and compasses that's right next to each other, basically means we've got this set up. And we just need to decide which end's the north and which end's the south. So it comes out the north and goes into the south. So that must be south there and that must be south there. Which means that's north and that's north. So that's quite a tricky question to understand what's going on, I'll be honest with you. Part 2. The student wants to determine the shape of the magnetic field for a larger area around the magnets. Describe how the student should continue the investigation using just one plot and compass. And that's worth three marks. Right. So using one compass, just place the compass, say, there. And what will happen is the compass will point in a certain direction. So what you need to do is you would draw an arrow pointing which way your compass was pointing. Then you'd take the same compass and you'd move it like there. And now it would start to move here. So you draw your little arrow there. Then you would move the compass again. Now it is good if you put the compass next to where your arrow's just finished. So then the compass would point that way. So you would draw your little arrow there. And then you just keep on moving the compass like that. And you can see, once you've got all your little arrows pointed, you'd then draw a line to connect all of those arrows together. And if you did it on the other side as well, you'd end up like that. So it would come out of here, come out of here, and it would go around like that. And I mean, that's what your magnetic field looks like anyway so just make sure you know that that's what the magnetic field looks like now how do you say that for three marks so place a plot and compass near the end of the magnet draw an arrow which way the compass is pointing move the compass and repeat the same steps and then connect the field lines together to show the overall shape. Of the magnetic field. Now to be honest that could be worth four marks here because uh, well there is a bit of detail involved in the explanation. Part B. Two long thin magnets are held with their north poles facing each other. The force F between the magnets can be calculated using the equation F equals K over D squared, where K is a constant value and D is the distance between the magnets. The magnets are 4 centimetres apart. The force between the magnets is 1.2 newtons. Calculate the value of K and state the unit. Right, let's just rearrange that. So K would equal F times by D squared. So if we just pop the numbers in, 1.2 Newtons times by 4 squared, 4 centimetres, and that equals 19.2. Now they want to know what the unit is. So we've basically took newtons and we've multiplied it by centimetres. However, we've squared the centimetres so that ends up as centimetres squared. 
Now we usually put a little dot in between the two of them if they've been multiplied. You could convert the four centimetres into metres if you wanted, but there's no need to, because they're asking us for the unit. They're not telling us the unit. If they said the unit was Newton metre squared, then you would have to convert that into metres. Right, part two. The magnets are held the same distance apart, but with the north pole of one magnet now facing the south pole of the other magnet. So before it was a north and a north, now it's a north and a south. The value of K does not change. State how the force would compare with the force in part one. Right, so the force is the same size, but it'll be opposite in direction. Instead of repelling, it'll now attract. Question 4a. Two cyclists ride on a hilly road and go through points P, Q, R and S. The diagram in figure 7 shows how the vertical height of the road changes during the journey from P to S. Right, part 1. The greatest overall change in gravitational potential energy for each cyclist is between which two points on the journey? Right. Well, the change in gravitational potential energy equals mass times by gravity times by change in height. So we're looking for the greatest change of height to give us the greatest change in gravitational potential energy. Right, so between P and Q, P is at a height of 0 and Q is at a height of 20. So that's a change of 20 metres. Going from Q to R, Q's at 20 metres and R is at 35. So that's a difference in height of 15 metres. And going from R to S, that's going from 35 metres down to 10 metres. So that is a change in height of 25 metres. So... The greatest overall change in gravitational potential energy for each cyclist will be between R and S. So each cyclist, that means that we're not really bothered about the mass and the gravity is obviously the same because they're all on the same planet. Part 2. The total weight of one cyclist and bicycle is 700 newtons. Calculate the total amount of work done against gravity when the cyclist travels from point P to point Q in the journey. Right, so from point P to point Q, P to Q, the change in height is 20 metres. Now the work done equals force times by distance. Or really what you should see is distance moved in the direction of the force. Now the force that we're talking about here is the weight. And weight acts vertically. So we need the vertical distance, which in other words is the height. So you could have probably just guessed that you needed to do 700 newtons of force times by the 20 metres change in height. And that equals 14,000 joules. Part 3. The gravitational potential energy of the other cyclist changes by 11,250. So that's the change in gravitational potential energy. When travelling from Q to R, let's just double check that. So Q to R. Ah, so Q to R, that's 15 metres this time. 
computer or so the change in height was only 15 meters ah the, i'm glad i've checked that calculate the mass of the cyclist so mass is our question mark and it tells us that gravity is 10 on earth of course it is right use the equation so we need to rearrange this equation to get m so the mass is going to equal the change in gravitational potential energy divided by the gravity times by the change in the height if we just pop the numbers in And that equals 75 kilograms. Part 4. Explain why the total amount of work done by a cyclist between points Q and R is different from the change in gravitational potential energy of the cyclists between points Q and R. Right, that's our standard question, just to make sure that you know energy is always lost in real life because of friction, and that energy gets lost as heat to the surroundings. And that's because of friction, which in this case will be air resistance. So some work is done to overcome air resistance. Part 5. The cyclists lubricated the chains and the wheel bearings of the bicycles before setting off. Lubricating the chains and the wheel bearings helps too. Right, this will be to increase the efficiency. Decrease the amount of work done against gravity? No. Decrease the efficiency of the cyclist and bicycle? No, we want the opposite. Increase the efficiency of the cyclist and bicycle? Yes. D. Increase the overall amount of energy transferred by the cyclist. No. The overall amount of energy transferred by the cyclist will be the same. It's just you'll have more useful energy because less has got lost as heat because of friction. Part B. The kinetic energy of another cyclist is 2,800 joules. The mass of the cyclist is 85 kilograms. Calculate the velocity of this cyclist. Use the equation. Kinetic energy equals a half mv squared. Right. So just in case you're not too sure about how to rearrange equations, I do my magic triangle. Top shelf. Now you've actually got something times by something times by something this time. So shove that in. Something times by something times by something. And I've got one thing and one space. So that must go on the top shelf up there. Now just basically cover up what you're looking for and what you're left with is how to work it out. So if we were to cover V squared, we'd end up with V squared equals kinetic energy divided by a half times by M. So we just need to pop the numbers in. And V squared comes out as 65.88. But we don't want V squared, we want V. So remember, we need to square root the 65.88 and that'll come out as 8.1. And that's meters per second. Question 5. The technician investigates different electrical devices that are used in a car. The technician connects a device to a 12 volt car battery. The technician measures the current in the circuit and the potential difference across the device. Figure A shows the car battery and the device that is being tested. A1. Draw on figure 8 to show how the circuit should be completed so that the current in the circuit and voltage across the device can be measured. Right, if we want the current in the circuit, we need to pop an ammeter 
as part of the circuit. And if we're going to measure the voltage across the device, we basically need to connect a voltmeter across the device. Now, obviously, we need to just connect that up there to complete the loop to make sure that the whole thing's going to work. So normally they don't leave it open like that. So they've just tried to change the question ever so slightly this year just to try to catch people out, which is fair enough. Part two, the technician tests a headlamp. The current in the headlamp is 4.8 amps. So current is I when connected to the 12 volt battery. So that's V. Calculate the power. So that's P supply to the headlamp. So you should know that power equals current times by voltage and just pop the numbers in. And that equals 57.6. And that's watts. All power is measured in watts. I've done the answer to one decimal place because they're numbers were at one decimal place. I know that one's got zero decimal places, but always do it to the greatest number of decimal places that they use. Part three. The technician tests an interior light. The current in the interior light is 600 milliamps when connected to the 12 volt battery. Calculate the energy transferred, so that's E, to the interior light in seven minutes. Well, that's T, but we're going to have to convert that. So seven minutes times by 60 seconds per minute. And we're going to need to convert 600 milliamps as well. So that's 600 times 10 to the minus 3 amps or you just take it and divide it by a thousand. So that will come out as 0 0.6 amps. And I may as well do this time while I'm at it. So seven times by 60, that is 420 seconds. Right, so we're looking for E. They've gave us I, they've gave us T, and they've gave us the voltage V. So we're looking for an equation that's got all of these things in. And it's from the list of equations at the end of the paper. Right, let's have a look. Right, there it is. E equals IVT. I mean, I prefer to say Emma Deal is on ITV. It's the same thing, ITV. So that's energy is the current, 0.6 amps, times by the time in seconds, which was 420, times by V, the voltage, which was 12. And that equals 3,024 joules. All energy is measured in joules. Pod B. The technician connects four devices to the car battery. Each device is connected to its own switch and its own fuse. Figure 9 shows how the four devices, fuses and switches are connected. The current in each device is shown next to the device. Right, here we go. So you've got a headlamp, which needs 4.8 amps. Interior light, which needs 600 milliamps. Right, let's get that converted straight away. In our amps, by dividing by 1,000. Heater takes 10 amps and the radio takes 2.3 amps. Right, part one. Calculate the current in the wires to the battery when all the devices are switched on. Right, wires to the battery. So basically, if that was a junction there, all of these currents here are going to be as a big current and then they're going to start splitting up. Now when they get back down to here, they're all joining back together. So that current there will be the same size as that current there. And it's basically all of these currents added together. And that equals 
17.7 amps. Part 2. State how the overall resistance of the circuit changes when any one of the devices is switched off. Right, well if you switch off a device, you're basically going from four paths, right? So there's path one, path two, path three, path four. If you switch one of them off, you're only going to have three paths. Now you can think about it as the current is trying to go down through the paths. If there's less paths, it makes it harder for the current to flow, so the resistance is bigger. Now the way I tell my students to think about it, is imagine you've just been to a concert, like the Sam Fender concert at St James's Park. If there's four doors to get out the stadium, all the people can get out quickly and there's not much resistance to them trying to get out. If they shut a door, or even two doors or three doors, can you imagine if there was only one door to get out of, only one path to exit the stadium? It's going to be a massive crush. Everyone's trying to go the same way. So that would be a huge resistance. So I don't know if that helps you, but it helps me in my mind and it seems to help my students. So the less paths you've got, the resistance increases. And the more paths you've got, it's easier for the current, so the resistance gets less. I mean, you can look at it mathematically if you wanted. Resistance equals V over I. So if it's the same voltage, if the current gets less, because it's harder for it to flow, because there's less parallel branches, that makes the resistance get more. Part 3. There is a current of 2.3 amps in the radio when the radio is working correctly. Which of these should the technician choose to protect the radio circuit? Right, they're all talking about fuses. You need to choose a fuse that is slightly bigger than the normal operational current. So we need to go 5 amp fuse then. 2 amps is too small. That'll just keep blowing every time 2.3 amps tries to go through it. 10 amps and 13 amps are too big. Part 4. Explain why the wires to the battery in a car are thicker than the wires that connect each device to its switch and its fuse. Right, so they're basically saying why are these wires here to the battery thicker? Well, it's obvious. It's because they've got to carry more current. And you don't want the wires to get too hot. So you need nice thick wires because that keeps the resistance small which stops the wires from getting hot. So it allows the wire to carry more current. Question 6a. An electric kettle contains 1.41 kilograms of water at 25 degrees C. So that's the mass of the water and that's the temperature of the water. T1, the temperature at the start. The kettle is switched on. After a while the water reaches boiling point at 100 degrees C. So that's like temperature 2. The specific heat capacity of water is 4200 joules per kilogram degree C. So that's C value, specific heat capacity. Part 1. Calculate the amount of thermal energy supplied to the water by the kettle. So thermal energy is Q. Give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. That's why it's worth 3 marks instead of 2. Use an equation selected from the list of equations at the end of the paper. Right, 
Well, significant figures. What is the largest significant figures they have used? Well, they've, that's the three significant figures there. So I'm going to do mine to three significant figures. Right, we've got to find the equation. So once again, what have we got? So we're looking for Q and we've got the mass and we've got the temperature and we've got the specific heat capacity. So once again, that's what we're looking for. Right there. Delta Q equals M times by C times by delta theta. So the change in the thermal energy equals mass times by specific heat capacity times by change in temperature. Okay, so here's the equation. Pop the numbers in. change in temperature so the end temperature take away the start temperature you pop those numbers in and that equals 444150 so 444,150 now we need the joules now we need to do it uh, an appropriate number of sig significant figures and I've decided I'm going to use three so that's four 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 and then that's just going to round down to zero 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 now if you chose to do it to two significant figures right you just look at these first two sig figs there then and then this third significant figure well, it's a 4, which is less than a 5, so we'd round that down. So that would be 4, 4, and then that would be a 0, and so would the other numbers. Okay? So that's to 2 sig figs, and that's to 3. To be honest, they'll probably accept both of them, but I'm happy with 3. Part 2. The kettle is kept switched on, and the water continues to boil. After a while, the mass of the water in the kettle has decreased to 1.21 kilograms. So it was 1.41 and it's gone down to 1.21. So it's changed by 0 0.2 kilograms. So that's how much of the water has boiled or changed state. So that's liquid going into gas. The thermal energy supplied to the water during this time was 450,000 joules. So that's our Q. And that was our M. Calculate the specific latent heat or vaporization of water. So that's L. Use an equation selected from the list of equations at the end of the paper. Right, so we're looking for something that's got Q, M and L in it. There we go. Q, M, L. So thermal energy for a change of state equals mass times by specific latent heat. So we just need to rearrange that then. So therefore, L is just going to be Q over M. So we'll pop the numbers in. So we only want to use the mass of the amount of liquid that turned into a gas by changing state. And that equals 2,250,000. And that was joules per kilogram. Joules divided by kilogram. I mean, as I say to my students as well, you, you probably didn't need to go and find that equation. You knew just to take the joules and divide it by the kilograms. Part 
Part B. This question is about determining the specific heat capacity of aluminium. An aluminium block is placed in boiling water, as shown in figure 10. The piece of string is tied to the aluminium block so the block can be transferred from the boiling water to the cold water. Right, so they've popped some aluminium into some boiling water and then they're going to pick it up and they're going to pop it into the beaker of cold water. Now what's going to happen is that aluminium is going to cool down once it's in the cold water and the cold water is going to heat up. Describe how a student could use this apparatus and any additional items needed to determine the specific heat capacity of aluminium. Your answer should include how the student would obtain the necessary measurements and use the measurements to calculate the specific heat capacity of aluminium. Now as I say to me students, and by the way this is the last question, the six marker, the six marker isn't always the last question, but it, it is this time. I mean, always double check as well. As soon as you hit those equations, you know it's definitely the last question. Right, as I say to me students, base your explanation on the calculation. So to get the specific heat capacity of something, we're going to need this equation here. So we're going to need to measure the amount of heat energy, the amount of mass, and the change in temperature, which means we're going to need to measure the starting temperature and the end temperature and then work out the change in temperature. And if we are going to get the specific heat capacity of aluminium, we need to rearrange the equation. So therefore, the specific heat capacity is going to be the amount of thermal energy divided by the mass times by the change in temperature. Now, if that's going to be the specific heat capacity of, of aluminium, we need to know the mass of aluminium. Now, we can get that by using a mass top pan balance. Okay, so place aluminium on the mass top pan balance. And that's how we'll get the mass of that. Now to get the change in temperature of the aluminium, now if we've popped the aluminium into here, we'd better get the temperature of the boiling water at the start, and then we need to get the temperature of this cold water once it heats up a little bit because you've added the aluminium. And to get the change in temperature, if we call that temperature 1, then we'll call that temperature 2. To get the change in the temperature, we just do temperature 1, take away temperature 2. Now we know that the temperature 1, the boiling water, that's going to be about 100 degrees C. So that's pretty much going to be something like, you know, 100 degrees C, take away whatever that final temperature is. So how many marks have we got so far? Well, we might get one mark for that, one mark for that, and then another mark for that, 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 that. So that could get us our six marks so far. I'll be honest, this question could easily be worth 12 marks. You just say it to yourself, well, how far do we go? Now, the one thing we can't get directly is how much energy we've put into the aluminium block. But what we do know, when you put the aluminium in this container here. The heat lost by the aluminium is going to equal the heat gained by the water. So technically, to get the heat gained by the water, 
you're going to need to know the mass of the water. We already know, I mean, we're assuming that the Telenos at the specific heat capacity of water is 4,200 joules per kilogram degree C. And then we need to know the temperature change of the water. So technically, we need to know the starting temperature of the cold water and the finishing temperature of the cold water so we can work out the heat gained by the water. And then that would be the heat lost by the aluminium. So this is what I'm saying. This could be worth 12 marks, really. So if I call that T3 and I'll call that T4 and then change in temperature this time would be T4 take away T3. I mean where do you stop? Get the mass of the water. So even that. So you'd have to know the, the mass of the beaker and then take the mass of the beaker away from the mass of the water in the beaker. Yeah, I think I'm going to leave it there. There's absolutely tons of stuff I've said there. Now, I have actually looked at the mark scheme as well. There's 20 different points that they will accept. So the, the, you only need to say six of them. So personally, I would just go with what I've put in the blue at the top part. Anyway, right, I hope that helps. And best of luck with your exam on Friday, June the 16th. If you're sitting your exams in 2023... Work hard, be nice, and bye for now.